What kind of school is this anyway? Hey! I can handle things, I'm just fine! Oh, but have you considered that he might just be that good? Not this good. Welcome to the Mr. IQ Podcast. Here's your host, Chip Franklin. In the not-too-distant future, our DNA will determine everything about us. A minute drop of blood, saliva, or a single hair determines where you can work, who you should marry, what you're capable of achieving. In a society where success is determined by science, divided by the standards of perfection, one man's only chance... How do you expect to pull this off? I don't know exactly. ...is to hide his own identity. This is the last day that you're going to be you and I'm going to be me. ...by borrowing someone else's. But in a place where any cell from any part of your body can betray you, how do you hide? When we all shed 500 million cells a day. That's Gattaca, the 1997 film starring Ethan Hawke, Uma Thurman, and Jude Law. Ethan Hawke plays a guy named Vincent Freeman, who's always fantasized about going into outer space. But he's grounded by his status as genetically inferior. They're called invalids. He decides to fight his fate by purchasing the genes of Jerome Morrow, played by Jude Law, a laboratory-engineered valid. He assumes Jerome's DNA identity and joins the Gattaca space program. Now, this dystopian film foreshadowed a few of the many bioethical dilemmas that face us today. Dilemmas like assisted suicide. Can or should a physician honor a terminally ill patient's wish to die? Should pharma create a pill that a woman could take to end her pregnancy? And 24 years after Gattaca, we now have the ability to see and experiment with the human genome. It's not whether or not parents should be able to cherry pick a child's looks, health, and intelligence. We're already there. The real question is, what happens if we create a designer race? If you've never heard of CRISPR, listen closely. CRISPR is a technology that can be used to edit genes and, as such, will likely change the world. The essence of CRISPR is simple. It's a way of finding a specific bit of DNA inside a cell. After that, the next step is CRISPR gene editing. And after that, well, that's a good question. Is evolution under attack or is this simply a different version? Dr. Art Kaplan is a professor of bioethics at New York University Langone Medical Center and the founding director of the Division of Medical Ethics. And he's nice enough to join us here on the Mr. IQ podcast. All right. So, Dr. Kaplan, what exactly is bioethics? So bioethics is a field that emerged in the 1970s, and it came about as a group of people began to ask questions about medicine and, if you will, the biological sciences about the ethics of what was going on. And the easiest way to understand it is there were pressing questions at the time about abortion. Remember, this is Roe v. Wade before it. People arguing about the pros and cons. New technologies were starting to emerge like kidney dialysis and people wanted to know who gets it. We had something called the ventilator, which we see all the time on TV now, but people wanted to know, when can I shut that off? How do I know if someone's heart is still beating, but their brain is gone? When is that ethical? And then other questions, can we distribute birth control to poor countries or is that racist? All these issues were bubbling around and people in religion, law, philosophy, which is my background, began to ask questions uh, like, when are we going to resolve this? Can we get agreement? Can we get consensus? And remember, there was one other phenomenon at that time, a terrible experiment called the Tuskegee experiment had just hit the news. African-American people had been denied a cure deliberately to keep them in the study for their venereal disease What rules did we need to prevent that from happening again? So those are the origin points of bioethics. And the rules are still evolving, correct? They are. And it's because research has evolved. When I got into this, I wasn't quite the originator, but uh, in pretty early days, 
All the research was done by one investigator at one institution using federal money on one grant. Today, research is done by dozens, if not sometimes hundreds of investigators all over the world looking at the same issue with corporate money, foundation money, or sometimes government money or combinations. It changes conflict of interest. It changes the way informed consent has to be done. It's one thing to consent somebody to be in research, let's say in uh, Richfield, Connecticut. It's very different if you're going to do it in Zimbabwe. Mm. And when I was at a college in, um, in the late 80s, I got there early and I was having lunch in the cafeteria and there was a, a, an older gentleman sitting across from me and we got talking and we had our lunch and um, we just, you know, I, I was from D.C. and he was asking me and he was a really pleasant fellow. It was Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, I wrote a joke that week uh, and the joke was my grandmother uh, was 94 and she just passed away. It was really sad. At the end, she asked me to help her commit suicide. At least I think that's what she said. Right. <laughs> and it, would, it would get a big laugh because obviously that's such a difficult ethical question. And I found Convorkian for that period of time, not knowing who he was, to be a very sweet and caring person, uh, mm. you know, to be at the center of, you know, what do they call him? Dr. Death for the longest yes. time. Um, where do we stand on that uh, in the in the medical world and the real world about ending somebody's life? who could continue to live, but who's in such pain, I think of more like ALS and other cases like that. Um, is there a standard for that? Yeah. What do we got, like a couple of weeks to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is one heck of an issue. So let me start by saying, when I got into this area, it wasn't really a field and no one had ever heard of it. People like Jack Kevorkian brought it into the public arena and everybody began to hear about it. That uh, Kevorkian at the time was kind of a renegade all on his own, helping people to die, back of his van, very controversial. And you may recall, he actually filmed, I'm sorry. Sorry. He actually, uh, you may recall, he actually filmed one of his... Uh, Patients, if you will, uh, that made it to 60 Minutes, and he was convicted and sent to jail for murder yeah. because he taped the thing. So as an early pioneer of all this, Kevorkian was doing things in a way that I didn't like. He didn't know the people he was talking to. Your joke was partly true. He'd meet him 24 hours later. They were in his VW van, and he was turning on his little machine, and that was it. Some of them he misdiagnosed. They were depressed. They were people who he thought had uh, Alzheimer's disease, but they didn't really, they didn't understand their condition. So there are all kinds of issues. I'll tell you, I actually testified against him at a trial really? in Michigan. Yep. What year? In the 90s? In 90s? Yeah, 1990. The case was called, uh, it was a woman named Janet Atkins who hadn't gotten the right diagnosis. He had helped her to die. And then the husband was furious because he basically acted, you know, inappropriately, if you will. Anyway, where well, we let me are ask on... you in the middle of that. Let me ask you a, a basic sure. question, though. If let's say um, a court says a person has their faculties and they're suffering from something like ALS, a, a horrible way to die. Should a physician be able to say, sorry, Hippocrates, I'm going to help this person move on? Um, I, for laws aside, in the field of bioethics, if, if I can make it as clean cut as that, is there any overwhelming majority of opinion that, yes, a person has a right to ask someone to end their life? When I started in these fights in the 90s, medical opposition was strong. It was a kind of fringe group that supported it. Today, many, many states in the U.S. have allowed assistance in dying by doctors, at least for the terminally ill. In Holland and Belgium, if you had ALS, if you were dying of a uh, terribly painful disease, but also if you had a psychiatric terrible depression, they will help you die. Canada's trying to figure out, are they going to be more like those countries or more like us? Yes, they permit it with, with restrictions. Morally, I can imagine someone, say, with ALS saying, I'm done and I don't want to suffer anymore this way. Maybe I've got time that I could live but I would think it would be ethical to help them or let them choose that. 
the psychiatric cases do bother me because what you see is a slippery slope. People start to say, sure, I'm depressed. I don't have good mental health services. We don't do things that help them. We just sort of say, well, you know, you can kill yourself if you're depressed. So part of this, I'm joking. Here's my joke back to you. I think it would be nice, say, in the United States, if we had a right to health care before we had a right to die. Fair enough. No, I, I think that um, having these discussions is is a, uh, is a path uh, towards a greater understanding. And I, and I think that's why I think bioethics, you know, as we move forward, I mean, I know we don't, we don't have a ton of time. I could talk about this for hours and you and I talk a lot anyway. Um, but let's talk about. Um, over time, as, as we've developed, I mean, there, I remember when uh, was it Christian Bernard? Was he the first heart transplant yes. person? There were a lot of people opposed to that uh, ethically in the medical community. Is why? I mean, you're saving somebody's life. Right. So he was desperate, but he also was trying to be first. And people said, you don't really have the understanding of what it's going to take to do the follow up care and what we would call immunosuppression. Remember, take an organ from somebody else and right. put it in you. The only way to make it stay there is to give drugs that get the body's immune system not to kick it out. And people were saying, you don't know what you're doing. Well, it turned out they were partly right. His guy, uh, the first person that he helped to treat, lived for a while, but then died. Other people tried to do it, didn't work. In fact, things got so bad, Chip, at one point, hospitals prohibited heart transplants. People were trying to do them. They said, no more till we get this figured out at the basic biology. So one of the issues in ethics is the investigator may say, I can do a face transplant. I know how to do a heart transplant. I know how to do whatever it is and I want to do it. And the patient says, let's go for it. Somebody else has to step in and say, you know, the investigator is so close to this, so blinded by the drive to make it work. The patient's desperate. They're going to do anything to live. We have to have a third party in there to say, is the science ready? Do you really have the team to do it? Are you competent to do it? And are you a crook just ripping people off by giving them false hope? I see that all the time in stem cells. How many ads have you seen online? We can cure anything. Come to our clinic. We got stem cells. Well, yeah, right. nobody's been cured. However, um, we do know that embryonic stem cells offer some great potential, and that's another area as well. Yeah, and, and, that, not, and, and in fact, I've been at the forefront of fighting to let that research <laughs> proceed. I, I think it's great, but I wouldn't go to just any clinic, even if I had a terrible disease, and say, yeah, give me an infusion of those cells, because the same situation's there. We don't know what we're doing, and it could kill you faster. Bioethics and um, ethics in general – oftentimes cross paths. I'm, I got, a, I got the vaccine. My wife's younger than me. We, we, we joked about this <laughs> talking previously, but right. well, um, everybody's younger than me, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're probably not that far apart, but uh, I, I look at, so my wife uh, has a, a friend who works in a doctor's office and they made it known that they would let my wife pretend she worked for the doctor's office and she could get it. And she's not okay with that. Mm -hmm. And so she and as much as I worry about her, she's instead going to try to sign up to volunteer. You volunteer three shifts uh, and then you'll get um, you can get a vaccination. So she wants. And so I really appreciate that. And that's why I love her. Uh, but I look across, you know, the the landscape uh, the American landscape. And, and I, I wonder how and this is a tough thing to ask you, how would you would judge the overall ethics, uh, both in, in, the, in the medical and, and, and research and also in general? Do you think that, that we, we are at a, um, a crossroads? Is there a pandemic of uh, attacking our ethics in our society today? And, and if if so, how can we become more aware of this without sounding preachy? Well, first, I think your wife is noble and. Uh... Got a ton of integrity in doing the right thing. And you should tell her I said so. Uh, very uh, proud and pleased to hear about her decision. Puts her at risk, but she knows that if she stays safe, others are going to be more in need. One thing the pandemic made clear in the U.S. is we're not concerned enough about community. It's me, 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 me all day long. I don't want to wear a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask. I want to go to the bar. I'm going to go to the bar. You can't make me do this, that, or the other thing. Well, I don't want to make you do anything. Ethically, what I want you to do is be concerned about your neighbor, the neighbor's kid, the person who's got a disease and they're really likely to die if they get uh, COVID. What about your mom in the nursing home? You're going to keep visiting there without a mask? 
So one problem I think COVID revealed, too much selfishness, too much uh, ego in our society. And Donald Trump, I have to say, fanned it. He yeah. really fueled that kind of thinking. He exhibited it all day long. At the same time, in areas like research, we're doing better. We don't have Tuskegee's. We don't have Willow Brooks. We don't have these terrible, terrible scandals of the past. We've got problems. Not saying that, that, the but, specter of those still hang though, in the African-American community. Oh, they do. Yeah. They do. They damaged willingness to take vaccines. What is it, 50 years since Tuskegee? And people still in the African-American community say you abused us and exploited us. And I don't trust what you have to say. Nonetheless, we're in a better position there. So we can make progress. It, it is possible. Racism fueled a ton of these abuses from the Holocaust to Tuskegee. We try hard now to teach our students, got to respect diversity, got to be inclusive. So within medicine, some progress in some areas. Within society, I think the pandemic is challenging a lot of our fundamental thinking. Let me give you one other example. People get mad when they hear about cutting the line or buying a vaccine or politicians going first. It reminds us of about a myth that many of us believe that we're all equal, that every life is equal. <laughs> well, no, they're not. And the vaccine thing makes it clear that in our society, the rich, the connected, the well-off do better. Now, people maybe say, oh, well, but that's not a news announcement. It is a news announcement. When you see it in something like vaccine distribution, you can't deny it. It's something we got to fix. Um, let's talk uh, briefly about animal research. Um, I'm a vegetarian and I've been since I was 15 and, uh, and it's, it's not about health, even though it's, it's a side benefit. It's about, you know, I, I just think that I can live without eating animals and mm -hmm. I know it, that it benefits our planet and our ecosystem. And I know if people ate meat one less day a week, it would greatly benefit our planet. But again, for me, it's really about torturing and, and killing these animals. Why does it seem that bioethics apply to animals? That's a great question, and it's an area I'm going to say we made over the centuries great moral progress. We used to think of animals as robots and not care what the heck we did to them. We right. tortured them in research. You think research today is bad. You don't want to be an animal in the 1790s in a lab. It's, not, it's, it's going to be bad. So we've made great progress saying we've got to think about animals, got to think about their pain and suffering, got to think about their interests. We try to reduce their use in research. We rarely use them anymore to teach anything in medical school or dental school. They used to be used all the time. I'm not a vegetarian, but I reduce my intake. And I do look for, if you will, uh, non-factory farm, non-mass produced animals, because I think uh, they suffer less uh, when we turn them into food. I think we've made progress. I think we do better. I think people will look back 100 years from now and say, you know what they did? They ate animals. It's unbelievable that they did that. You know, it's so barbaric. So I think the moral force is on your side. Yeah. I think. Uh, well, Gandhi the said it. Is vegetarianism. Gandhi's statement about you can judge a society by how they treat their animals, I think, is, yeah. is, is a big yeah. part of it. Um, and I, I'm not judging people. Hey, look, my wife and kids eat, eat meat. Right. So, I mean, it's uh -huh. it's yeah. an, you know, it's it's actually harder on her because she has to cook around, you know, my needs. On, well, I, on think a, that, I think it's in a good place. I don't think you have to apologize for it. I think you're actually more leading on the cutting edge. I think the rest of us will have to catch up. Well, speaking of cutting edge, um, genetic manipulation. Now, you know, the CRISPR technology, which I know just enough about to sound stupid. Um, <laughs> moving forward, I, I want to ask you about that, about, you know, being able, like if I, if in, in 50 years, if I can go into an office and say, I want a boy, I want him to be over six feet tall, and um, I'd like him to have uh, blonde hair and no, uh, you know, bald pattern, whatever, to go through. What are the problems that that, that poses? Because I have a feeling that that's coming, whether we try to stop it or not. It's coming. Yeah. And part of the reason it's coming is we want to use genetic engineering to fix diseases. So we'll jump into that lake start to get rid of Huntington's disease, start to get rid of sickle cells, start to get rid of uh, terrible diseases like hemophilia. But then people are going to say, well, what about if I just want to bump up my intelligence of the kid or get rid of freckles or uh, is baldness a disease? You know, I maybe, and I think we will get there. So the main issues are these, who's going to have access 
Is it just going to be the rich having more and more advantages that they already have, but now they have designer kids with much more capabilities than the poor? And the other issue is, am I taking away my kids' ability to choose their future if I narrow what they can do? I say, well, you're going to be a quarterback or you're going to be a violinist or I insist that you uh, wind up uh, uh, being uh, super strong. And you sort of say, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I want to be something else. But you, you get it designed into you. We like to say kids should have something of a choice about their own future about what they want to become, about who they want to be. But if the parents are imposing too much on what they think is good, look, we have it. It's tough enough for the kids now when the parents are all over them about take tennis lessons or you got to go to Yale or NYU is the only place for you. Imagine what it will be like when the parents design that stuff into their kids. My argument would be um, I'm a baseball fan and the fastball is the pitch that, you know, it, it rules the day. But it's the curveball that gets into the guy's head, right? And I also – I think that like Nietzsche was right as well. I mean how much would we miss if we didn't have the struggle, the struggle to survive, if it was just given to us with some sort of genetic jump start? We evolve in ways that you can't see in a human genome, right? The third, there, there's a ghost in the machine, and I'm, I'm an atheist, but I do believe that there are things that I don't understand. And the harder I try to understand, the more, the, the more they elude me. A good example would be like uh, if I took a piece of paper, rolled it up to a ball and threw it without thinking, and it goes into the trash can, I try to recreate that, and I can't recreate it. It happened then. You know, I mean, if you were a primate, though, you might be able to do it because you wouldn't be thinking about about, mm -hmm. I want to do it again. So these are things that that obviously aren't going to show up in CRISPR technology, right? Well, look, there's a, a, where you're headed is this. If you have CRISPR technology and you're designing your athletes, then you're not having a competition about effort and will and perseverance and all those virtues that we like to think. It's a combination about who had the best scientist, who had the best gene design. I find that less interesting. Yeah. Even in the Olympics now, starting to think, is this just who's got the best pharmacy? It certainly undermined things like cycling, right? We, the people who kept winning kept doping. And at some point you start to say, they're not training, they're not struggling. It's not what human effort is all about. It's just who's got the best drugs. So that is a downside, absolutely. Um, and, and down that line, uh, I guess, is this is, we're talking about a bioethics. This is probably the greatest one. And, and I believe at some point, We'll be able to do this on what scale and 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 with what what means I'm not sure, but creating life, um, and this is the ultimate ethical mm -hmm. dilemma, right? Um, and and first of all, defining life and then creating it. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I see you drinking Dunkin' Donuts here on the West Coast. I truly miss that coffee. We don't. Have that <laughs> you know, I'm from Boston, and that's where it's from. Oh yeah, when I was a kid. I got addicted. Yeah. Um, if you could just not eat the donuts, you're in great shape. Right? <laughs> the idea that if, if we had the ability to create a zygote that could, you know, be implanted and move forward, we already can. We can, you know, do it, but it's not the same, right? Yeah. But what if we could create um, not artificial intelligence, but real intelligence, intelligence that was that could evolve? Would that be ethical? If we could do that, is that as catastrophic as it, it seems, or is that just a natural evolution of thought? And science. I think it's a, I, to me, it's a natural evolution. I don't think it's catastrophic. I think it will happen. I think there are people even now who are thinking we better start thinking about how we design artificial intelligence so that it doesn't come after us or eliminate us, but complements us, works with us, lives in peace with us. Um, and I think at the creation of life, the big threat is it takes away our feeling of being special. It takes away the notion that somehow whatever else is out there, there's, you know, inorganic stuff, uh, rocks and uh, dirt and chemicals. But then there's this special life thing that obviously is very different. Well, if we can do it, it's not so very different. You might say it's the last distinguishing characteristic of humans. We found out we're not, we're kind of like animals. Darwin taught us that. We find out uh, we're not the center of the universe. Copernicus teaches us that. And all of a sudden we find out that life isn't even special. Guys in labs can create things. But I'll make a prediction. That'll be a problem, but not for a long, long time. More likely we'll create life forms like superbugs and even some of your foods. You know, you can see synthetic meat beginning to be 
developed. You don't need an animal. You just got to grow the meat in a vat and you can have a hamburger that uh, has nothing to do with animals. I think we'll see things used that way. I worry a little bit more about biological warfare with superbugs than I do sort of super babies, at least for the next hundred years. Yeah, I mean, humans like to look at ourselves at the top of the chain. Um, yeah. There's a comedian friend of mine had a joke and he was, um, kids are smart. You know, I know that. I don't know one kid with a full time job and kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I think about that when I look at animals as well. And I try to de determine, you know, what exactly is intelligence? Because obviously we're talking about ethics here. We're talking about people with self-awareness and a sense of our place. That's one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to animals and their experiences, because, you know, it's, it's it is amazing. They, they don't worry about the things that uh, <laughs> that we worry about, like money and fashion and 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 just possessions. And, you know, why are we evolving away from that kind of consciousness? Where will we be as a species in, say, like 500 years? Is that even worth examining? Are there futurists out there trying to figure out um, what human beings will look like? There, there I, are. There are. And I think it's futile. It's, it's impossible yeah. to do it. I don't pay any attention to it. Seems to me <laughs> you look 500 years backwards and see what people would have predicted in 1500 about where we are. And nah, I don't think so. No, well, I, I can't I, three do it. Years ago now, right? I mean, look, look yes. I mean, the, the interesting thing is a note to end on. In one way, we all think about it would be great if we were immortal. But at some level, if you're 500 years from now and you can't understand the culture and, you know, all of your friends uh, are, you know, in very different places or some have died through accidents and this sort of thing. I don't know. I don't think you can you can't project yourself that far ahead either by trying to guess what it will look like. I'm not even sure you can really imagine what it would like to be there 500 years from now. We're too much a product of our time, our context, and our place. Yeah, I guess if somebody asks you how long you want to live, maybe the right response is, what time is it? You know, I mean. Yeah, well, somebody <laughs> asked me that, and I said, do I have to go to faculty meetings? <laughs> Uh, Doc, thank you so much for your time. This this was uh, one of our best conversations, and I really do appreciate everything, and I know the listeners will as well. Please stay safe and uh, keep thinking outside the box. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to the Mr. IQ Podcast with Chip Franklin. To hear more, go to MrIQ.com or wherever you download your podcasts.